Today, we're looking at physical and chemical properties and changes, the differences between the two. A physical property is a characteristic that can be observed for a material without changing its chemical identity. So it's an observation you can make about a substance without actually changing what the substance is made of. So I, if I give you a pile of iron nails, like this one, you can look at it and you can say, iron is silver in color. Okay, You have not changed anything about those nails. They are still made of iron. All you've done is you've told me that they're silver in color. So they're still made of iron. No change there. A chemical property, on the other hand, is a characteristic of a material involving its chemical change. So this cannot be observed without changing the chemical identity of the material. So if you take those same silver nails and you let them sit outside for a while, exposed to the elements, they're going to start to rust. Iron rusts in the presence of oxygen. That rust is a sign of a chemical change. So a chemical property of iron, it rusts in the presence of oxygen. You'll notice it's gone from a nice shiny silver color to that kind of rough, orangey brown substance on the outside of it. It is no longer iron. There are two different types of physical properties. There's intensive properties and extensive properties. An intensive property is a physical property that, that does not depend on the size of the sample of material, or in other words, how much you have. So no matter how much of a substance you have, you are not going to have different, the intensive properties are not going to change. So for example, no matter how much sulfur powder you have, it's yellow. Whether you have a pea-sized amount or you fill an entire classroom full of sulfur power, powder, it's going to be yellow. An extensive property, on the other hand, is a physical property that is directly proportional to the size of the sample of material. So an example here, the more sulfur you have, again, the pea-sized amount versus the classroom-sized amount, the more mass that sample has. So, makes sense. The more of something you have, the more mass it has, yet its color is not going to change. That's intensive versus extensive. So, some examples of intensive properties or properties that do not change with the amount of substance. Uh, you can observe color texture, luster, remember that's how well something reflects the light, how shiny it is, uh, whether or not it's malleable, if it can be uh, molded and shaped, if it's conductive of electricity, if it's ductile, it can be hammered out without shattering, uh, it's density. We'll talk more about density later, uh, but basically how much mass is in a given unit of volume, that ratio is not going to change no matter how much substance you have. Uh, boiling point can be observed and it's going to stay the same no matter how much of something you have, the temperature at which it boils. Melting point is another example. Extensive properties, you have mass like we just talked about. Remember these are changing with the amount of substance that you have volume, how much space something takes up, length, okay, if you've got a spool of thread, the more of it you've got, the longer that spool is going to be. Uh, the area that something takes up is going to change with how much you have. The thickness of your substance may change depending on how you're manipulating your amount. Some examples of chemical properties Remember, chemical property can only be observed when you change the chemical composition of a substance. So, like before, when we talked about our iron nails turning to rust, we have actually changed the chemical composition of the substance. It's gone from iron to iron oxide. So, there's an example, rust, also called oxidation. Uh, but whether or not something is combustible, if it can explode, uh, if it's flammable, if it can burn, uh, decomposable, like a tree or a body, 
Uh, and then radioactive decay, again something else we'll talk about later in the year, but that's when an element actually changes into another element. Like that. Okay, physical versus chemical changes. Um, a physical change is a change in the form of the matter, but not its chemical identity. Remember, stress, a physical change does not change a chemical identity. And most of these can be reversible. So, for example, a phase change. If you start with an ice cube it's made of H2O, a compound, you melt that ice cube, okay, it turns into water. So you now you have liquid H2O, but it's still H2O. You heat that liquid water, it's going to turn to water vapor, which is a gas, but it is still H2O and can be condensed back down into the liquid. Uh, tearing a piece of paper, it's still paper, even though you tear it, tear it a million times, still paper. Or if you cut your hair, yes, you can't just attach your hair back together. Oh, I wish, I wish I could. Sometimes when I get those bad haircuts, but it's just a physical change. Okay, still got hair on the floor, still got hair on my head. It's still made of the same substance. A chemical change is again a change in the material that results in a different chemical identity and this is irreversible this isn't something that you can just heat it up or cool it down and it's going to change back into what it was before like with a phase change so some examples of this if you burn wood I'm sure many of you have uh, been camping and had a campfire or just used a fireplace in your house that substance that the wood changes to, that ash, no longer has the same properties of that wood. You cannot burn the ash. Okay, it is no longer combustible like that wood was. Uh, it's metal corrodes, uh, and co remember, corrode is not like erode. Erosion, like where the ocean eats away at a rock, is not the same thing because you still have rock. You got bits of rock that are floating around. But the corrosion is like when you leave batteries in something too long and then you open it up and it's got all that white crusty stuff. Been, the acid's been leaking from the batteries and so it's corroding the metal around it. Or if you bake a cake. All right, you start with your raw eggs and your flour and your sugar and your oil and your milk and all that business and then you bake it, it turns into something yummy and delicious. Uh, but you'll notice that it has totally changed and you can't unbake that cake. Okay, signs of a chemical change. Uh, we're going to look at four, and not all of them must be present at the same time, and they're not all a surefire guarantee of a chemical change, but they are most common, and usually they do mean, hey, something's happened here. So if you hear a sound or see some flames, or if the temperature changes, either increasing or decreasing, we call this sign a transfer of energy. Energy within the chemicals has been changed into a sound or into flames or into a temperature change. Either up or down is fine. Another one, our good old nails, they're back. What do you notice about these nails from beginning to end? We start with a nice shiny silver color, end with a kind of muddy brownish orange color. Color. Here's an example of a color change. Now this is not the same as if you add food coloring to water. Okay, you still have water, you just add a little food coloring, disperse the particles around. That's more of a solution. Uh, our third sign of a chemical change, if you see bubbles without adding heat, or you smell something, good or bad, uh, this is a production of a gas. It's those gas particles that are causing the bubbles. Uh, they're coming up through the solution. For example, here we've got hydrochloric acid with magnesium metal or smell. A smell is carrying uh, particles of your reaction, production of a gas. 
that gas is wafting towards your nose. And our last one we're going to look at is probably the hardest to conceptualize because it's not something that you're going to see very often. Um, but it's if you take two liquids, two solutions, okay, and for especially in this example, we start with two colorless solutions, pour them together, and all of a sudden we've got this yellow solid in our solution. Well, where did that come from? That's weird. That's called a precipitate. So a formation of a precipitate or a solid from two solutions is another example of a sign of a chemical change. So let's do a little reca recap of these signs. Uh, we've got transfer of energy in the form of sound, flames, change in temperature. Remember, it could be hot or cold. Uh, color change without, this is without adding a dye. Production of a gas. So bubbles, except when you boil. Remember, that's a physical change. That's just a phase change. Uh, and then an odor is another sign of a gas. Or a formation of a precipitate, a solid from two solutions.